Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Sue Huppert. I'm Vice President for Des Moines University, and I'm here on behalf of President Angela Franklin, along with the entire DMU community, to welcome our guests, all of you here to DMU. President Franklin is driving across the country taking her youngest son, Jordan, to college. Now, for those of us that have made that trek across the country or somewhere, you know that she's exactly where she needs to be. So, Congressman, she wishes she could be here, but obviously needs to be with Jordan. Des Moines University has a long history of educating health care providers throughout our state as well as the nation and the world. We have a chart up here of our over 2,200 graduates that we have in all three of our colleges and our nine degree programs. Our mission is to improve lives in the global community by educating diverse groups of highly competent and compassionate health professionals. And we have many of you in the room today, so thank you for being here for this discussion. Here to introduce our guest is the co-chair for the Partnership for Better Health, Mr. Chris Atchison. Mr. Atchison is the director of the State Hygienic Lab, Associate Dean for Public Health Practice and Clinical Profession in Health Management and Policy at the University of Iowa. Prior to joining the University of Iowa, Mr. Atchison served for eight years as the director of the Iowa Department of Public Health and was elected the first chair of the Iowa Child Health Insurance Program, which we all know as IHOC. On the national level, Mr. Atchison has served as the president of the Association of the State and Territorial Health Officials in 94 and 95 and was chair of the Joint Council of Official Health Agencies. He is the recipient of the Arthur T. McCormick Award for his numerous contributions to public health and practice. Please join me and welcome Mr. Chris Atchison. That's a nice introduction, and, and what is uh, particularly nice is that uh, you could take most of uh, what was uh, said about me and say it about uh, Dr. Mary Hansen, who's uh, back there as well. She was also an ASTO president and, and all that, and I think we were, were, we were the first two Iowa sitting commissioners, well, the only two Iowa sitting commissioners who've been president of that national organization. Well, thank you, uh, everybody, for coming uh, to this uh, uh, second in a, a series of uh, healthy discussions hosted by Des Moines University uh, and the Partnership for Better Health. Uh, these bipartisan forums are intended to uh, bring attention to the health issues uh, during the campaign season, uh, particularly around the partnership's uh, triple agenda. Uh, and I do want to add my special thanks for Des Moines University in hosting these. Uh, and uh, President Franklin, uh, who is uh, someplace in uh, the, great, uh, the Great West, uh, taking, going out to Pepperdine uh, to take her son out for uh, a visit there. Uh, and I think they may make some stops along the way, and Sue can tell you exactly where those stops may be uh, later. Um, let me tell you a little bit about the, uh, the partnership. Uh, we're now uh, some 60 uh, organizations all concerned about uh, a triple solution of prevention, uh, intervention, uh, and innovation. Uh, in other words, uh, try to identify uh, health issues become, before they become a major problem. Uh, uh, as uh, uh, issues develop to have prompt intervention uh, so that those uh, problems can be arrested as, as quickly as possible, but recognizing that the agenda is constantly changing. Discovery uh, is absolutely vital uh, if we're going to be able to control uh, health care costs and indeed continue to uh, extend the quality of life that, uh, that we all want. Uh, and that's what the partnership, uh, which was formed before the presidential elections uh, uh, back in about 2007, uh, articulated at that time. And uh, we're so glad to have uh, the opportunity with the expanded membership uh, and all of you uh, involved in uh, carrying that forward. So um, it's, it's important to, to recognize that uh, the partnership uh, does not support or oppose any individual candidate or political party in any way or advocate 
advocate for any specific legislation. Our purpose uh, is to educate and inform all candidates, uh, regardless of political affiliation, uh, and we hope to have today another in those, uh, uh, those kind of open, uh, bipartisan uh, dialogues about health. Uh, and I'm particularly honored uh, to have the opportunity to introduce uh, today uh, the dean of Iowa's uh, congressional delegation, Congressman Tom Latham. Uh, Congressman Latham is a nine-term uh, Republican and has represented the people of Iowa since January of 1995. Uh, Congressman Latham grew up and was raised uh, and raised his family near Alexander, Iowa. Uh, he's uh, in agriculture and a small business owner. Uh, for many years, uh, the congressman ran Latham Seeds, uh, a family seed company that his father started in 1947, uh, along with his two brothers. Uh, today, the company is operated by Congressman Latham's nieces and nephews, niece and nephews. Uh, congressman Latham and his wife, Kathy, have three adult children, Justin, Jennifer, and Jill. They also have one granddaughter and four grandsons. Uh, Congressman Latham is Iowa's only member of the House Appropriations Committee, where he serves as the chairman of the Subcommittee on Transportation, Housing, and Urban Development. He's also a member of the House Appropriation, Appropriation Subcommittee on Agriculture and the House Appropriation Subcommittee on Homeland Security. I also noted, uh, checking just some uh, web information, that the congressman has been involved in sponsoring health, uh, health legislation. So I'm very pleased to invite uh, the Congressman Latham up to the podium. Thank you very much, Chris, for that uh, kind introduction, just like we wrote it. And uh, <laughs> uh, I think uh, this sign up here really says it all about uh, in, investing in uh, prevention and, and uh, in health. Uh, the chronic uh, health concerns that we have is certainly uh, what costs all the money and is the long-term problem. But uh, thank Des Moines University for hosting this here today. I've had the chance uh, to visit here several different occasions, and uh, I wish Dr. Franklin were here, but give her my best, please. And uh, uh, I know what it's like to take kids off to college like that. So we've had three of them, thankfully, graduate and leave home. How's that? Huh? Uh, but I do appreciate the, uh, the warm welcome and the uh, opportunity to participate uh, in the Healthy Discussion Series. Uh, the Partnership for Better Health is playing, I think, a very important role in focusing our attention on lowering health care costs and improving health care outcomes in the long term. I know there's a number of medical students here, which I had the pleasure of, uh, of meeting, and uh, uh, as well as those representing patient groups and parts of our health care system here in Iowa, and I thank you all for being here. Uh, your input is critically important. Uh, as decisions are made in Washington because they affect nearly every person involved in receiving or providing health care. Uh, I'd like to have a productive discussion today. Uh, I've got a few uh, prepared comments here, and then I'd like to open it up for your questions. Uh, as you know, the future of the President's new health care law is a central issue in this next election. Uh, it will result, uh, uh, the result will determine much of the direction of health care policy for the foreseeable future. For those of you who are entering the health care profession, I, I believe there's an enormous amount at stake for you because the health care law will bring many challenges for those who have dedicated their lives to this work. Uh, for example, I'm very concerned about the impact of the Independent Medi Medicare Payment Advisory Board. Uh, known as the IPAB, which consists of 15 unelected bureaucrats charged with cutting Medicare payments primarily to physicians. The law makes it nearly impossible for Congress to override any of the Board's orders and shields the Board's decisions from judicial review, as well as from input from patients and the providers who will be affected. The President's plan for Medicare relies heavily upon the IPAP to lower Medicare cost growth, and he proposes to actually strengthen the Board's powers even more so. And for these reasons, I, I voted uh, in favor of the House legislation this year to repeal that Board. 
another concern is that half of the newly insured under the health care law are covered simply by expanding Medicaid eligibility, increasing by one-third the number of Medicaid patients within 10 years. And as you know, Medicaid is in many cases a below-cost provider, a payer, and expanding the Medicaid program will make it difficult for many physicians to continue participating in it. I think it's extremely unfair that if Medicaid patients can't get access to the care they need because of those limitations, they're actually barred from participating in the new health care exchanges as an alternative. Exchanges are a sensible way uh, advocated by free market analysts. Uh, unfortunately, the health care law took this market-based idea and twisted it into a mechanism weighed down with regulations and government restrictions well, will do little to foster competition. According to the Congressional Budget Office, as you know, which is the supposedly independent uh, 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 group that we look to for scoring, uh, the result will actually be 10 to 13 percent increases in premium costs around $2,100 uh, average per family in the exchanges compared with the current non-group market. Only about half of exchange participants will receive subsidies to help pay for these increased premiums. Despite spending more than $2 trillion cutting Medicare by more than $700 billion and increasing taxes by over $800 billion, the law does not lower health care costs. Uh, in fact, the most recent government projections show that by 2021, increases in national health care expenditures will be nearly 30 percent greater due to the health care law. The law is also flawed, I believe, uh, for what it does not include. It does not provide a fix to the unworkable Medicare formula. Uh, which has required Congress to scramble every year to prevent enormous cuts to physician reimbursement. Uh, it's astonishing and I think outrageous that the largest change to our health care system since the creation of Medicare would fail to fix this problem. It hurts the physicians in Iowa because they already receive some of the lowest Medicare reimbursements in, this, in the country. Uh, and if you look at what the health care bill did include, was student loans, 80, because they got $80 billion worth of credit for including student loans, but excluded the doc fix. Here's health care reform without doctors involved, but student loans are involved. Uh, that would cost about $32, uh, $232 billion at that time. Today, the price tag has gone up to about $300 billion over 10 years for that fix, not included. This is something that's going to go on and on and on. Uh, the cliff that you're facing as physicians at the end of the year is somewhere around 30 percent of your reimbursement will be cut if, in fact, those changes aren't made. But that was not part of the health care bill. Uh, to me, unbelievable. The law also fails to offer any significant solutions to the medical liability costs. According to the American Medical Association, it's the reason why half of the counties in America do not have an obstetrician, why medical students choose specialties based on avoiding frivolous lawsuits, and why 80 percent of physicians practice defensive medicine because they fear lawsuits. It's a boon to trial lawyers. Uh, because they've, uh, with 125,000 cases in the system on any given day. Uh, to put this number in perspective, it's more than twice the number of medical students in the country. Uh, the point I want to get across to you today is this. The direction of health care policy I support will correct these problems and allow for the kind of innovation and efficiencies that will limit the growth of health care costs. The President's plan simply does not. There's an effort in Congress to repeal and replace the law, and I'll support that effort. But I believe there's a great deal of common ground that can be reached. After all, Republicans and Democrats share the goal of addressing the millions of Americans who are underinsured and have no health insurance at all. 
I've offered H.R. 30, uh, 364, the Common Sense Health Reform Americans Actually Want Act, which is a replacement proposal that includes many reforms that have a track record of bipartisan support. It would first guarantee coverage by modifying, expanding, and adequately funding high-risk pools to cover at an affordable rate anyone with a pre-existing condition who is unable to uh, obtain affordable insurance elsewhere. It would also create nationwide competition between insurance carriers by allowing individual policies to be purchased across state lines. It would establish small uh, business health plans so businesses can pool together to negotiate lower health care premiums. The bill includes common sense medical liability reform, which will save taxpayers more than $50 billion and even uh, save even more uh, in total health spending as the practice of defensive medicine is reduced. Furthermore, the legislation would retain certain provisions in the new health care law that are already in effect, uh, provisions that enjoy widespread support among Americans, including preventing insurers from unjustly canceling policies, eliminating annual and lifetime limits, and allowing de uh, dependents to remain on their parents' policies until they're age 26. The bill would lower health care costs for millions of Americans without adding a penny to the deficit. It can be done. Now I'd like to really shift topics and talk a little bit about Medicare, which, as you may well know, is the 800-pound uh, growl in the room when it comes to health care. First of all, reforming Medicare is not optional. The program is on the path to bankruptcy, and the trustees report that Part A uh, trust fund will be depleted in just 12 years or in 2024. An average couple now retiring and becoming eligible for Medicare is expected to have medical costs more than double what they paid in Medicare taxes when they were working. Without serious reforms, this gap will have to be financed by higher and higher taxes more, or more deficit spending, uh, which is an enormous and, I think, unacceptable burden for today's young people. The President's health care law claims to help Medicare's finances, uh, but it counts the, the $700 billion in cuts to Medicare twice, once to extend the solvency of Medicare and, again, to pay for the massive new entitlements for non-seniors, people not involved in Medicare, uh, created under the law. Simply by paying doctors and hospitals less, without other reforms, the Medicare actuaries estimate that as many 40 percent of the hospitals, nursing homes, and home health care agencies will eventually be forced to either close their doors or stop seeing Medicare patients. This is something that we've uh, already, we're already beginning to see in Iowa, and it will only get worse without other changes. Medicare's inefficient and fragmented fee-for-service payment structure makes it an open-end program that is ultimately unsustainable. I believe that innovation in payment structure and care delivery is a solution. I know many of you are working on these solutions, and I've talked with several of you about what you're doing. Uh, you are the experts in how to deliver the highest quality health care at the lowest cost to patients in Iowa, not Congress, not federal bureaucrats, and not the President. I believe the government should get out of the way and give you the freedom to craft solutions for the future of health care in this country. Medicare needs a reform plan that harnesses this ingenuity. The House Republicans have proposed a bipartisan plan developed by House Budget Committee Chairman Paul Ryan and Democrat Senator Ron Wyden. It's the only credible plan proposed so far that would save Medicare from bankruptcy, allowing beneficiaries to receive the same or greater level of benefits at a lower cost. Future Medi Medicare beneficiaries would have a choice of Medicare plans. In addition to traditional Medicare, they could keep what they have uh, that are competing for businesses. These Medicare health plans would also have to offer coverage that is equivalent to traditional Medicare. While the premiums, benefits, cost sharing, and provider reimbursement structures could vary, the value of the plans would have to be the same. 
the government contribution would be similar to what is currently under traditional Medicare. Those who are older, sicker, and have lower incomes would get additional help for any out-of-pocket expenses. The idea of choosing a Medicare health plan isn't new. Traditional Medicare is already unaffordable for most people, as 90% of seniors already have some type of supplemental insurance to pay for out-of-pocket costs, paying an average of $150 per month in addition to their Part B premium. Government bureaucrats and Congress now make decisions on Medicare coverage of procedures and determine what hospitals and doctors get paid down to the smallest item. Not only are these decisions often disconnected from reality on the ground, but the lengthy and cumbersome process often becomes politicized. Can you believe it? Uh, because Congress is involved, it should be no surprise that it can take years and even decades to resolve the smallest problems. This is why Medicare coverage often lags far behind most private insurance. Wouldn't it be great if we could remove politics, micromanagement, and bureaucratic decision-making from the equation? Let the people who actually take care of Medicare patients come up with the solutions. No matter what the outcome in the election in November, the country, country needs your expertise, and I strongly encourage you to stay engaged Give us your advice, your counsel. Uh, the decisions being made are certainly very, very important to you and the future. I'm willing to work with anyone, regardless of party affiliation, to find a solution to Medicare, the Medicare crisis and a way forward for health care reforms that Iowans and all Americans desperately need. So I would now like to open it up for uh, questions and uh, discussion. Okay, hopefully the mic is on. Um, I'm Jan Lau. I'm with the Iowa Alliance for Retired Americans. And um, I've been on a number of health care commissions throughout the years by different governors. And it seems like the consensus has been over and over that we can all agree on wellness and prevention. And that's something this group has talked about as well. Um, in, uh, we have a new Medicare benefit in terms of being able to get um, screenings without copays and closing that donut hole on prescription drugs. If the Romney-Ryan budget goes through, it will eliminate those things. Um, will you agree to support those particular measures and oppose the Romney-Ryan plan on that? Uh, I think that there are... Uh in the proposals that we're talking about, the additional plans that you would have in choices and to attract your business, those things would be uh, involved. Certainly as far as screenings, which you currently get under Medicare right now, when you sign up for the Part D prescription dr drug, you automatically get a physical a wellness checkup under that uh, currently. Uh, on the, the donut hole, I, everybody would love to see that closed. What, what is going to happen uh, to pay for the closing it is going to be at least a 50 percent increase in premiums for everyone and Part D to pay for closing that hole. So it's not free. Uh, the Medicare Part D program has over 90 percent support as it is. Uh, anything that we can do, obviously, to help close that donut hole would be very positive. Uh, what I uh, have some concerns about certainly would be the increase in premiums for a lot of seniors uh, that it would affect also. But no, anything we can do to close it, that, that would be, that's great. I just don't want to see massive price increases for the premiums to do it, which in the bill, that's what it does. Thank you. Hi, my name is Doug Chu. I'm a volunteer with the American Heart Association, also a survivor of uh, heart disease. And the uh, National Institute of Health uh, has provides $200 million approximately to the state of Iowa, which translates into around 4,000 jobs. And yet at the end of the year, it faces the uh, automatic spending cuts or the sequestration, if I said that word correctly. You did. Uh, and so my question is to you is, 
How do you think we can stop, uh, protect the NIH and uh, from that sequestration or spending cuts and protect the 4,000 research jobs, which probably many people here will hopefully be able to take advantage of? Thank you. This is a very real threat. Uh, the House actually has passed a reconciliation bill that would do away with the sequestration. The Senate has not acted at all. I would hope that they could pick it up and do what, what the House has already done to stop the sequestration. Uh, but if you're not familiar with what this is from the uh, budget ceiling uh, bill last year, the agreement was that if the super committee could not come to resolution that there would be $1.2 trillion of cuts. Uh, half of which come from security accounts such as defense, homeland security, FBI, things like that. And the other half would come uh, about $600 billion over 10 years uh, to other discretionary uh, accounts such as funding for the NIH, such as your education programs, uh, and all across the board. And because of the exemption of some of the entitlements, it, it's more, it weighs more heavily than ever on exactly what you're talking about. So it would be my hope that the Senate would actually act over there uh, when we get after, and it's going to be put off until after the election, I'm sure, but uh, we've got to bring resolution to this before the end of the year. January, January 2nd is actually when the sequestration goes into effect. It will be devastating. It will be extraordinarily expensive because you'll lose all kinds of contracts, research that's already underway that will stop and then have to restart. Uh, it is extraordinarily expensive to do this. It is something that we cannot let happen. I will do everything possible to see to it that it doesn't happen. But uh, you, boy, that, that is the largest immediate threat to health research, to education, to every other program that's out there. Um, Eric Martin from uh, IWART Center. I'm the uh, Director of Preventive Cardiology for IWART Center. I'm also the uh, Medical Director for American Heart Association for Des Moines. And I would echo Mr. Chu's concern with the uh, decrease in NIH, NIH funding. With cardiology, we're so heavily uh, reliant on uh, research from NIH establishes us as a global leader in, uh, in um, uh, healthcare, healthcare advancement and healthcare uh, education as well. My other concerns, you have mentioned that the uh, proposed uh, CMS um, fee schedule for 2013 even poses another 30 percent reduction in physician payments as well. And in fact, I'm part of the uh, advoc advocacy committee for Society of Cardiac CT and the, uh, the multiple uh, uh, payment reduction uh, um, for 2013 actually penalizes physicians for being efficient. For example, if a patient who comes out uh, to Des Moines who's from 150 miles away to come in for tests, basically it penalizes us physicians for becoming very efficient by doing those tests in one day. Currently in the proposed scheme, if, the, if that patient actually has those two tests in one day, the second test will be reduced 25%, if there's, God forbid, there's a third test, that third test will actually be reduced by 50%. It's not sustainable from the physician's standpoint. It seems like we're being penalized for being efficient, not realize that, uh, we, I don't think we realize that those patients will now have to take two days off from work because from a physician's standpoint, we're gonna have to send them twice to, to Des Moines. So they have to travel uh, 150 miles away twice, plus take off work uh, twice as well. So another concern from the physician standpoint. Uh, I, let me just, this is why you should be making a lot of these decisions rather than people in Washington that have no clue what happens in the real world. I mean, it is, to me, I, I have medical professionals doctors, nurses uh, come in my office all the time. And to me, it is one of the most degrading things I've ever seen. These are true, professional, extraordinarily highly educated people who have to come to Washington and beg for their livelihood. It's simply, it's wrong. 
That's why you ought to be in charge of this, and you understand where the savings can be can be had. And and you know regulations like that make absolutely no sense. But if you're sitting in an ivory tower in Washington, someplace writing these regs, uh, you know maybe somehow they think that that's going to save some money, with no regard uh, as far as the consequences to individuals themselves and what it costs them. Uh, I mentioned in my talk earlier about the, the reimbursement cliff for physicians. Again, how in the world you could have a major medic, uh, medical health insurance takeover and not include physicians in a huge health care bill is way beyond anything I can comprehend. It's because it, including student loans, the takeover of student loans in it, because you get $80 billion of credit and not including physicians in the health care bill because they would have to come up with another $232 billion. Now it's $300 billion over 10 years. I mean, how many years do we have to go through this? That you can, physicians come in and beg not to be cut by 20, 25, now up to 30 percent at the end of the year. It, yes, sir. Yes, we have one. Are the president of the student body at Des Moines University? <laughs> Yay! Thank you, Tara Hughes, medical student, Des Moines University. As you mentioned earlier, Iowa physicians already have a pretty low reimbursement rate compared to other states. Um, with the looming cut even further to reimbursement rates and the rising cost of medical education and student loans, are there any plans in the future to attract more physicians to Iowa? It seems that that um, with all of that looming overhead, that it would be difficult to attract more physicians to Iowa in the future. Are there any plans or initiatives being taken for our Iowa residents? Well, and certainly to under, uh, give assistance to physicians going as far as their uh, tuition reimbursement to underserved areas would be extremely important. You're not going to go out into the rural parts of Iowa with $200,000 worth of debt and expect to be able to pay that back. And that's why there's such a draw to the urban areas uh, where you can uh, generate more revenue. Uh, and, you know, you folks are doing what you're doing for the right reason because you really want to help people no matter where you are. And uh, to me, we've got to have reimbursement that actually would allow you to go into rural Iowa, where today already people are, uh, physicians are talking about some have retired early, some are saying they're no longer going to take Medicare patients because of the reimbursement issue. Some of them uh, are, certainly are not taking Medicaid already. Uh, and it's, it's extreme. We've got to fix the formula. We made some advances back in 2003, changing the geographic differential uh, in the formula for reimbursement. We've, but we moved up from like 49th or 50th to like 42nd or something now. Uh, it's still not good enough. But that's what we've got to do. And that's, that's why additional cuts that are in this plan, and anyone, that's where the $700 billion comes in. It's going to be targeted at physicians, hospitals, nursing homes, home health care providers, all of those folks that uh, provide the great quality health care that we depend on today. But No, I, my mother's 95 years old, nursing home up in Hampton, and uh, it's going to be very difficult for her to have a physician up there and to have the quality of health care in that nursing home uh, if these cuts go into place. 
Yes. Hi, I'm Carol Sifley with the Alzheimer's Association. And I appreciate your comments about the need to fix Medicare. Um, and I really want to point out the fact of what Alzheimer's disease and people with Alzheimer's is going to do to Medicare. Um, we know now that about 5 million people have Alzheimer's, and if nothing is done to change the course of the disease, that's going to end up to be something like 16 million people with Alzheimer's by the middle of the century. And if Medicare is in trouble now, imagine what it's going to be like in 20 or 30 years. So I'm interested in your thoughts on what the country's priorities should be to change this, to, to change the tide, the trajectory that we're facing with Alzheimer's disease. Um, obviously, research is one of those things, but I'm interested in your thoughts on what some of those other things might be. Thank you. Well, we have to at least maintain the reimbursement that's out there for the health care providers that are taking care of. My father, I, think we, I know we visited, but my father passed away with Alzheimer's and was in a nursing home uh, unaware of his surroundings for four years. And the incredible care that he received uh, was was phenomenal. I mean, these people care for them. They they go way beyond what anyone could expect. You know, someone a health care provider. But that will not be possible if, in fact, uh, the massive cuts. And I think it's around 66 billion dollars uh, that is going to be cut out of uh, nursing home care uh, under the president's health care bill. It just will not sustain. And you've got 40 percent of those facilities right now. Uh, who are at or below break even with additional cuts they're either going to have to close or have such minimal amount of uh, staffing that you're not going to get the health care. So uh, we've got to at least, I, th I think we can actually enhance uh, through competition uh, the, uh, the amount that goes into that type of care, in fact. But uh, it's that it's nearly nearing a breaking point today, let alone additional cuts into the system, especially targeted at those home. And it's, it's going to be worse in rural America than anywhere else, which I was very, very dependent upon. My mother, obviously, very important to me. So. Thanks, Congressman. Sure. Uh, my name is Midge Slater, and I am a senior third congressional district voter. Uh, I've been on Medicare for three, three years now. The first year, uh, I had my one lifetime screening, and I was welcome to Medicare. And lo and behold, the next year, I got another screening, and the next year, I got another screening under the Affordable Care Act. And I'm grateful for those screenings because I have had a discovery of a cancer I didn't know I had. And uh, I'm grateful also for the excellent health care I am receiving. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things I was aware of that I would like your response on is that as someone not participating in a Medicare Advantage plan, because I was able to continue paying per month uh, for previous secondary coverage through my employer. Uh, I was, in fact, paying additional money for overpayment that was agreed to uh, to the companies providing for those Medicare Advantage plans. And my understanding is that part of the cut that has happened under the Affordable Care Act is the cut of the overpayment to those uh, insurance companies that went above and beyond the actual cost to provide those Medicare Advantage plans. Uh, I also am understanding that more money uh, with the insurance company, for example, that I have insurance with for my secondary coverage, is now having to go to actual insurance coverage and less on overhead. Uh, as a consumer, that sounds pretty darn good to me. And as one who was a little bit rankled about paying so that somebody else could buy an Advantage plan, I wasn't real happy about that. Uh, however, I'm always willing to provide my fair share so that we can all have health care. But I was also glad to hear that that was going to go away. Now, uh, you have talked about changes you would make should the conditions change. And I would like to know how you would address 
those overpayments to insurance companies to assure, in fact, that we are getting the, insur the uh, health care that we're paying for. Well, whether you call it uh, overpayments, uh, we have 60,000 people in Iowa who are in Medicare Advantage. At least half of those will lose the coverage that they are very, very happy with today. Uh, you mentioned your uh, prescription drug benefit from the company that you worked for before. Because of the Affordable Health Care Act, uh, there are many huge companies that have dumped all of their retirees into the uh, Part D prescription drug. Look at 3M. Look at companies all over that because of the cost that this has put on, it has now put more of a burden on the federal government to pay for those benefits. Uh, and uh, to me, and they were very happy, uh, the retirees were very happy with what they were receiving, paid for in the private sector rather than have the government. But because of the act, there are hundreds of thousands of people who have lost their, their company paid uh, drug insurance. One thing that I think is fascinating, uh, do you hear any discussion anymore about competitive bidding, about reimportation of drugs? There was a grand deal that was made before the bill was written with the White House and Big Pharma to take, you know, that they took away those possibilities. That was, that was the deal that they made. So all the changes that I heard about for years and years from uh, folks saying that you're supposed to be on the side of, you know, the big drug companies, those deals were made in the White House beforehand. So ba they're getting a really good deal, the pharmaceutical companies on this. But let me just say there are hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of Americans who have lost their company prescription drug plans because of this act and have put that burden now on the taxpayer rather than pay for it in the private sector. Yes. Hi, I'm Molly Schneider. I'm a second year medical student here at DMU. And I would like to just reiterate this gentleman's concerns about the sequestration and um, concerns to medical students as you know, we're already concerned about the bottlenecking that's happening with residencies and with further cuts to Medicare, that's obviously not going to help fund GME. And so we were just wondering um, what your thoughts were concerning if this does happen, if, you know, maybe funding of GME is going to head towards privatization, maybe by pharmace pharmaceutical companies or insurance companies. And just your thoughts on that and if this happens, if government will play a role in regulating this. Well, I, as far as the... GME, I, it's going to be taken care of, whether it's before or after. The problem with waiting till afterwards is that it becomes extraordinarily expensive because you've broken all the contracts that you have in place at that point, and you have to go back and renegotiate. Uh, it, just government-wide, out of defense industry, it's going to be extraordinarily expensive to cancel all those contracts and then reissue them again. And the same thing in the, the research area. Uh, it is going to be taken care of, but it's just a matter of how much pain we have to go through and how ex expensive it has to be uh, to take care of the problem. But I can, it'll be okay. So we're starting to run out of time. One more question or comment? Oh. Okay. There she is, that student body president again. Here we go. The prerogative of presidency. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, we have talked quite a bit about the new health care mm -hmm. reform act, but um, I was wondering if you feel like Mr. Ryan's plan to reduce spending in Medicare relies too heavily on the competition in the private sector, and what if that competition doesn't pan out the way that um, I believe he thinks it's going to happen. Well, the, the only cuts, reduction in spending in Medicare are in the President's health care plan. $700 billion that's cut out of Medicare after people have paid into it all of their lives and now is being used to fund a separate new entitlement that has nothing to do with Medicare. 
what Mr. Ryan is talking about is the same level of uh, support of traditional Medicare. You'd have the option either of traditional Medicare or a comparable, uh, it has to have at least the same coverage or greater and be at the same price. So, uh, no, you have the option of staying in. This affects nobody currently in the system. Those that uh, are coming in in the next 10 years would not be affected. But what it does is introduce competition that will save money, keep that money in Medicare. And again, the, the President's health care plan is the only plan that cuts anything out of Medicare, and that's $700 billion. So. Okay, Jan. One more. <laughs> in terms of competition, isn't that what the Medicare Advantage plans were supposed to kind of pilot, is to show that the private sector could compete in this arena? And hasn't that been an abysmal failure because they are reliant on these government overpayments or subsidies? Well, let, let me just say, in the Medicare uh, Part D prescription drug plan came in 40 percent less than what the projections were because of competition. That's con according to the Congressional Budget Office. It, that plan cost 40 percent less than what CBO said that it would when it was enacted because of competition, because you had companies, insurance companies, competing against each other, holding down costs. And that's the same model that we're talking about here. Either you have the choice of staying in traditional Medicare or a plan with at least comparable benefits that would probably cost less. If it does cost less, there would be bids put out. The second lowest would be the one chosen, probably less than what the Medicare reimbursement is. If you pick the lowest, you would actually get a check back from Medicare. But the way they're going to have people come into the system is through additional benefits than which you would have in traditional Medicare. That's what happened. And, the, you know, the Medicare Advantage plans, that's why you know, there's over, I believe it's close to 95 percent approval of their Medicare Part D plans right now, including especially uh, the Medical, Medicare Advantage plans. People have them, love them, uh, and they've been a great success. It saves money in that the bids will come in, in in Medicare. They will come in less than what we're currently paying in Medicare. And to get people to go into those policies, they will offer additional benefits. And if the, the lowest cost, if you would choose that one, you would actually get a check back. For, for the uh, recipient, uh, the Medicare Advantage program is very, very reasonable cost, very cheap. Well, but it's subsidizing the rest of them, too. We are uh, out of time. I'm sure the <laughs> congressman would be glad to uh, entertain uh, individual discussions. But uh, on behalf of the partnership, uh, I want to thank the congressman uh, for being with us. If we can give him a hand. Thank you very much. Also want to uh, thank all of you for being here. There's actually another event similar to this. Uh, tomorrow, another healthy discussions uh, at noon in this very same room with uh, Congressman Leonard Boswell. Uh, stay tuned uh, uh, with us uh, as we uh, reach out to the presidential campaigns and the other uh, uh, candidates for Congress in the state, and we will get more information to you. Again, thank you to Des Moines University for hosting this series. Thank you, Sue, and give our best to President Franklin. <laughs>